Hello everyone, my name is Aaron Standard. I'm one of the founders of Akka.net and I'm the CEO of Petabridge. And today I wanted to talk a bit about async A weight versus pipe two. These are the different tools that Akka.net actors can use to process uh, asynchronous programming patterns that are used elsewhere in .NET, uh, namely the Task and Parallelism Programming Library, otherwise known as the TPL. So the first thing we want to try to remember uh, as we start going down the road of thinking about you know, asynchronous programming with actors is that actors are designed to process messages serially, meaning they process messages one at a time. So we have a mailbox that buffers up to N messages that have not been processed. And when an actor is scheduled for processing by its dispatcher, which is the component of Akka.net that usually for user-defined actors has them run on top of the .NET thread pool. So this is what actors are programmed to do. They're programmed to process messages one at a time. Uh, we can't begin processing message one until the actor's receive method has completely exited for processing message zero and we work our way sequentially through the content of our mailbox and process the messages in the original order in which they were received. The reason why actors are programmed to do this is because it guarantees that actor state is always thread safe. If actors can only process one message at a time, it means that you don't have multiple messages all trying to either read or write the actor's state concurrently. As a result of being a serial processing you know, entity, we are able to go ahead and eliminate the need for locks, critical regions, and other synchronization mechanisms. This is the fundamental reason most developers look at actors in the first place. It's because it makes concurrent programming something that's much easier to reason about. It gives us the ability to go ahead and say, okay, rather than having a bunch of complex synchronization mechanisms that give even computer science experts a lot of trouble in practice, why don't we go ahead and break up our workload into lots of different actors that each own an individual, let's say entity that makes up our domain. And we can go ahead and leech, let each entity kind of update its own state in a serial fashion. But we have the ability to send messages to tens or thousands or millions of them all at once. And they can all schedule their messages and process them asynchronously without the need for all these complex synchronization mechanisms. So that's the original reason why we're using the actor model in the first place. And we're gonna go ahead and introduce the way we handle asynchronous programming with, it, with this sort of context established here. Now, if you've watched our video on how actors restart, this diagram will look very familiar to you. Uh, these are all the components that actually make an Akadana actor tick under the covers. Uh, first, we have the actor cell, which is what an actor reference actually points to. So whenever we send a message to an actor reference, we're really delivering it to the actor cell. The actor cell is the piece of connective tissue that unites the actor with its mailbox and then unites the mailbox with the dispatcher. So whenever we're delivering messages to an actor, we're enqueuing these messages inside the actor's mailbox and the mailbox is gonna to signal to the dispatcher that I have messages to process and the dispatcher will schedule this actor for execution. Once the actor does get executed, your code, which lives inside the actor itself, is going to begin processing the messages that are pushed into it via the mailbox. Uh, and then the actor will have a chance to process, by default, the dispatcher will let each one process 30 messages per burst. And then the actor will be rescheduled again if there's still messages in the mailbox that haven't been touched yet. So this is generally speaking how actors are designed and constructed. And we're gonna to need to take a look at this again in the context of what happens when an actor awaits in the middle of processing a message. So that's why I'm kind of introducing this now. So when an actor awaits, we still need to uphold this one message at a time guarantee. So when the actor is scheduled for execution, it's gonna receive a message and it's gonna process it using a receive async handler. This means that this receive handler is gonna have at least one await statement inside of it. And so we start processing this message, then we hit our await block. And once that occurs, the actor is going to suspend its mailbox, meaning that the actor's ability to process additional messages for the time being is gonna be put on hold. And that's because in order for us to honor our one message at a time guarantee, we have to process everything inside this receive async statement before we can move on to processing the next message because logically this is all considered to be, you know, one single message that we're processing. Even though, you know, we're gonna go ahead and temporarily suspend processing while this asynchronous operation completes in the background. And once that operation does complete, the actor is going to send itself a, what's called an actor task scheduler message. This is a private class that is a system message. 
System messages can still be received when an actor is in a suspended state. So this message will get the jump the line, get processed first, and this will trigger the rest of the receive method that's after the await statement to execute. And the actor will do this all the way through to completion for every single one of its messages where it has an await statement. We're gonna go ahead and process all the awaits for that receive method until we begin processing the next message. This allows actors to behave just like any other piece of .NET code when it hits an await statement. So we're able to go ahead and make sure that all of the internal state of the actor is still thread safe, and we're able to go ahead and preserve those actor messaging guarantees while also still allowing awaits to function as normal inside the actor. Now let's go ahead and contrast this with pipe two, which is a slightly different take on how to do asynchronous programming with actors. In pipe two, we use a normal receive method. Even though this receive method is going to generate a task that we could await, but in this case, we're not going to. What we're gonna do instead is say, you know what? I'm gonna kick off this task, but I'm not gonna wait for it to complete before I begin processing my next message. Instead, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna start processing message two right away. But that task, once it completes, we're gonna use the pipe two extension method, which is part of Akka.net, to have the output of that task delivered back into my mailbox as a new message. And that message will be processed likely after the other content that was already in my mailboxes. So that's why you can go ahead and see, you know, envelope three, which has this type T queuing up behind message two, which we're currently processing. And then the actor will use likely a different receive statement to go ahead and process this message. And we'll be able to go ahead and essentially interleave uh, some messages ahead of others inside our mailbox. So this is sort of at a theoretical level what our actors are doing with each of these different programming approaches. I'm gonna dive into a code sample real quickly and show you in practice how these look differently and how these affect the performance of the actor differently as well. All right, so the code sample we're gonna run is this await repository on my personal account. Now, uh, I am gonna use Phobos, which is a proprietary library built by Petabridge. Uh, so you will need to purchase a license to that. You wanna run the sample exactly. However, it's uh, pretty easy to go ahead and disable it inside uh, configuration here. In fact, I'll show you how to do that. Let me fire up Ryder, and we're gonna take a look at our two key actors. We have an async await actor on the left <clears throat> and a pipe two actor on the right. They both do the exact same work, just in slightly different ways. So we receive this batch of messages, and this messages.batch just contains a size value that'll tell us how many messages we need to send to ourselves. And so we're gonna go ahead and basically preserve the original sender by calling a forward on ourselves, and we're gonna go ahead and just send ourselves a bunch of these request objects. And for each one of these request objects, we're gonna A wait on a one millisecond delay. And then we're gonna go ahead and tell this acknowledgement uh, back to the original sender. And those are all gonna get written out to the console using a custom uh, petabridge.command palette that I wrote over here in the command folder. Now, the pipe two actor is gonna work mostly the same way. I'm gonna format it a little bit here. There we go. It's gonna work mostly the same way, except instead of doing an await, I'm gonna go ahead and use a continue with here and then pipe the result of this, uh, this little ACK operation here. I'm gonna go ahead and pipe the result to the sender and say that the message came from us. And so this is what my sample is gonna do. And using petabridge.command, I'm gonna be able to toggle between uh, using pipe two versus using async await. Uh, that's what this little scenario, I'll go ahead and close this this scenario CLI is for, these are just custom uh, commands for petabridge.command that my command line client will download when I connect to my application. And then we're gonna go ahead and use just a little bit of open telemetry here to visualize how the operations look different when I'm awaiting versus when I'm using pipe two. You'll be able to notice some differences in the total processing time and also the way the graph looks. The output itself might also look slightly different when we run this. Uh, by the way, if you want to disable Phobos, you can run this sample. Uh, you just need to go ahead and get rid of this line right here. That'll go ahead and disable Phobos. Um, actually, this whole Phobos setup you can probably get rid of. Uh, that'll disable Phobos, but uh, you won't get the nice graphs at Jaeger like I'm about to show you. So let me go ahead and run this sample. Go ahead and spin that up. All right, great. So our sample's up and running. Now I'm gonna go ahead and pull up the command line here and move my terminal over. And I'm gonna go ahead and run one of these samples here. So I'm gonna go ahead and do an uh, await sample. 
uh, using uh, 10 total operations of my batch. So let me run that. And lo and behold, I get all my acknowledgements, zero through nine, in the order in which I expected them. And it looks like this completed relatively quickly. Well, let's go ahead and take a look at what this looks like in Jaeger. So I'm gonna go ahead and reload. And I'm gonna see I have my aka.async await service here. And I've got a number of different little operations. Uh, let's just go ahead and search for all of them. And this big operation right here is probably the one that we wanna look at. All right. So this operation took roughly 200 milliseconds end to end. And it began with, uh, let's see, Aka IO, that's the system pedibridge.command uses for handling uh, TCP connections from clients. We went ahead and we received um, a payload indicating that we wanted to run the A wait scenario. We started some actors to be able to handle that. And then we sent that actor the A wait instruction. It started our batching actor, which I believe. As they started our async away actor and also started our, if I go down here, our batching actors, that's both of those spinning up. And then we actually go ahead and begin delivering the batch right here. So we go ahead and deliver a batch to our async away actor. That's this right here. And then we go ahead and we receive, let's see this request. And we go ahead and send back an act. And this gets turned into those command responses uh, that you can see right here on uh, this little window. And you'll go ahead and see underneath this batch are all these little like these these little threads of um, <clears throat> request processing right here. That for each item in the batch, we're gonna go ahead and run a little graph that looks like this. And you can see these graphs are all neatly staggered at least one millisecond apart from each other. Now processing each individual message doesn't take that long, but this gap you're seeing here, and by the way, this gap might be longer than one millisecond. Uh, that's because the average clock resolution on Windows and Linux and OS X is roughly like 20 milliseconds when you're running on a, a desktop OS. Uh, it could be, so that, that means that this value, it's tough for the operating system to guarantee a value lower than 20 milliseconds is the bottom line there. So that's what this little graph indicates here is that each operation is starting after that delay completes until we finally get down to the last one here. And you can go ahead and see these delays kind of spread out over the histogram in Jaeger. All right, so that's async a wait. It preserved our message order really nicely. We're able to go ahead and guarantee that all these operations completed in which the, in the original order in which they were sent. And it took roughly 200 milliseconds to execute all of them. Now let's compare that to pipe two. And we're gonna go ahead and run the same number of operations this time. So lo and behold, check this out. Our operations actually completed out of order this time. This is because as we saw in our graph earlier, pipe two does not guarantee that operations necessarily complete in the order in which they were originally requested. Uh, that's because all 10 of these tasks are basically gonna be started right at one right after the other. And the order in which they're completed by the operating system and by the .NET thread pool is somewhat non-deterministic. So that's why these events all appear to have been processed out of order. Now let's see if I can find the Jaeger graph where this was processed. Uh, let me go here. This is it, it's the same number of operations as before. Let's see, 54 and 54, okay. So it's the same, same amount of work happening. But let's take a look at this. Total duration, 10.48 milliseconds. So this took 1 20th the amount of time uh, to go ahead and do all that processing. And so what are you gonna notice right here? Well, you're gonna go ahead and notice that we have, when this batch comes in, we have our first, let's say, request operation here that took three milliseconds for some reasons, probably because the task.delay uh, didn't complete in exactly one millisecond. And then we went ahead and received some command responses. But get a load of this. All of these requests were all received roughly at the same time. That's what we're seeing here. That in between each one of these, let's say, batch operations, we didn't wait to receive an ACK before we began processing the next request, which is something that we did do when we were awaiting it all. So instead we kicked off all of these task.delay operations one after the other, just like this. And it took them, let's say it looks like between 5.5 .5 milliseconds and 10.5, so about five milliseconds for all those operations to complete, again. That's because the operating system can't really guarantee uh, that anything will necessarily complete uh, beneath 20 milliseconds with any sort of consistency. So it took about five milliseconds uh, for those one millisecond task delays to complete. 
but all of them completed in very short order like this. And so this is where we can see the parallelism of the pipe two kind of working on our behalf. So the messages were received out of order, but they were all able to run in parallel essentially. And that's why this total uh, graph here only took about 10 and a half milliseconds versus nearly 200. So that's a major difference between async await and pipe two is async await has the stronger ordering guarantees, but pipe two is ultimately gonna be higher throughput, but it's gonna be more difficult to reason about the results uh, as a result of the fact that messages can now arrive in somewhat arbitrary orders using pipe two. Okay, so I've had a chance to show you that async await and pipe two are both perfectly viable tools for working with the TPL inside Akadata Actors. Uh, await works exactly the same way it does in every other part of .NET, uh, which is that in order to complete the scope that you're in, this sort of method scope, or in the case of an actor, it's receive method scope, you have to go ahead and complete all the different await operations that kind of make that little state machine that's right there. And until you do that, you aren't gonna be able to process any new messages. So this means that await's gonna block the mailbox's ability to process new messages until each one of those state machines completes. That actually can greatly simplify the error handling process when an asynchronous operation goes wrong. That's something you have to do uh, somewhat cantankerously with pipe tube. So it simplifies error handling quite a bit and it also makes the flow of control a lot easier to reason about inside an actor. So for instance, if an actor needs to make sure that we write this thing to the database and wait for a response to come from another actor, and we also need to go ahead and save the output of both of those operations into a file, it's very easy to go ahead and encode all of that into a single receive handler with three awaits. Uh, very easy to go ahead and do. Um, the advantages of pipe two have to do primarily with throughput. Uh, because pipe two doesn't block the actor, it's possible to interleave multiple workloads. And this is because the tasks that are being executed are fundamentally executing as detached tasks, meaning they're not actually blocking the actor's flow of control. The advantage of this is that for high throughput jobs, let's say you have an actor that's responsible for downloading web pages and using an XPath parser to try to, you know, maybe do search, search indexing or something like that. Uh, Pipe2 is great for that use case because one actor can run many instances of that task in parallel if it wants to. Uh, but the results of how you deal with errors in that situation or how you deal with flow control can actually be more difficult to reason about. So I would only really recommend that Pipe2 get used in contexts that are relatively simple and require high throughput. Otherwise, it's probably easier for your actors to go ahead and use a wait uh, for being able to handle their asynchronous operations they might need to do in the course of any Akadotnet programming you're doing. Uh, one word of caution I would put about a wait though is that you do need to make sure you time out anything that you a wait because the actor will not be able to receive any other messages you send to it while it's going through the, the steps of processing all those a waits. So you wanna go ahead and make sure you're still following normal .NET best practices there and using things like cancellation tokens for those. So that's it for this video. Uh, I'm gonna go ahead and, and give you some more resources that you might wanna use for further reading. Uh, as always, the official Akadotnet documentation contains a lot of information about uh, the current state of Akadotnet. And we've been spending a lot of time at Pettibridge recently working on updating that. Uh, you should also check out our blog for some more Akadana tutorials and content. And lastly, if you're interested in the custom pettibridge.command palette that I wrote, you should go ahead and check out our documentation for that tool at command.pettibridge.com. And if you want to learn more about Phobos, which is what I use to go and visualize all of those traces that were happening uh, inside my async and pipe two actors, you should check out phobos.pettibridge.com for that. Well, thank you very much for your time, and please leave any questions you might have for us in the comments.